Okay, uh, welcome. So I, I'm Luca Del Faro. I'm the instructor for this class. Uh, here is Justin. Justin is the TA for the class. Uh, there is the two of us. Maybe we will have some uh, some uh, readers uh, for the class, but so far it's the two of us running the course. So uh, that, um, uh, a little bit of introduction. So this is a class on Android, of course. Uh, I actually was undecided long time ago, not long time ago, three years ago when I started teaching mobile, whether I should teach it for Android or iOS. Um, the main reason I chose Android at the time, and I, I would choose it even now, is that uh, uh, it's easier to teach, meaning that you don't need to all have Macs in order to develop. And I didn't want to deal with the log logistics of having a lab where you could, uh, you know, on the, all access uh, the development environment. I think it's unfortunate that Apple doesn't make it. Uh, the development environment available more widely. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I thought it was logistically more, uh, uh, logistically easier. Uh, so, you know, it's early also for me in the morning. I only had one coffee, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I go on three, four per day. Uh, but uh, not only it, it, uh, th that was a factor, but also uh, Android has a, uh, nowadays a much larger market share. Uh, I don't know the latest numbers. I think they're hovering around, what is it? Maybe, you know, 70%, 80%, uh, something like that, uh, okay? And uh, why is mobile relevant to me? Essentially, uh, not to me, but why do I think it's really relevant? Uh, I think once I heard, uh, I don't know from, uh, from where, I, where I heard this quote, I, I actually know where, from, uh, from a friend at Google that was uh, chatting uh, with me just socially. And we were you know, bantering about mobile development and web development and other things. And uh, then he essentially said that there's a short line that said, you know, um, laptops and, and uh, the web has been the first uh, um, nearly one billion users, and mobile will be the next six, seven billion. So this is essentially the reason why I think Android uh, is important, because essentially an iPhone is a first world device, no? It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, for people that uh, most people who have an iPhone also have other devices. Android will be, you know, uh, more likely what is available all over the world. So if you are looking at the new frontier of computer science, uh, the one that will uh, give access uh, to most of the humanity, this will be mobile, and, and the, right now it will be Android. You know, nothing stays the same forever. So I'm sure that you know, in 15 years we, it will be passé, and uh, we will be talking about something else. It always happens, okay? But, but it seems that if you want to reach widely, uh, and Android is the choice. Um, then, uh, you know, I, I can uh, give some other comparisons about iOS and Android. Uh, we can do it uh, later on. Um, I was surprised to see, actually, because I, 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 I'm sort of concerned in a startup where we try to push a product uh, out uh, that, that has an iOS and Android um, releases. And even though I think the Android product is superior right now, uh, we are supposed to see that iOS uh, take up is higher. So there is some truth to the fact that when you start developing and you, you start to have a product, the iOS uptake is faster and the monetization on iOS is easier. You know, there is something to be said for that. So, um, so what people say that it's easier to make money on, uh, on uh, iOS than on Android is actually true, I believe, or at, at least uh, that's what we see, okay? It may not be true for all apps, but, uh, but there is some truth to that. I haven't really understood whether it's, uh, uh, you know, just because the people who have, have iOS are more, uh, on average, uh, um, computer literate and so more curious about uh, downloading and installing other apps, or whether it's because uh, it's, uh, um, you know, the Apple uh, uh, store that works better than the Android store in, in uh, getting apps known to people. Uh, I don't know if one factor or the other or a combination of the two, but we, uh, but we definitely notice it. So, 
You know, the, the advantage of Android uh, as I see for the class is logistics and global reach. The drawback is, uh, um, the drawback is essentially that, uh, you know, monetization and spread uh, uh, is not necessarily easier, even though the user base is larger. Uh, the other thing about, uh, uh, about uh, Android as a comparison is that I think it's a little bit easier to develop in the sense that you get actually more meaningful error messages and, more, yeah, and, and easier logs when things go wrong. So this helps developers, actually. Uh, I don't think it's a bad experience to develop for Android at all. Um, so, um, so, so, so much for the generalities. Um, yeah, I will, uh, you know, give you more during the course. So, w what are some quick facts about the class? So there is me. There is the TA. Uh, there are some requirements. I, I would like you to have an Android device. It doesn't need to be. Uh, it doesn't need to be a device that has a Wi-Fi wireless plan, obviously. Okay, Wi-Fi only is good. So. Uh, an old uh, device or a spare device or something like that is good. I put a pointer on the web page for a device that is about, the last time I checked, the price was up and down. It's, it's, it used to be $60 recently, now it's only $40 for that device. It's a Moto G with a, with a, with a strange prepaid plan. I mean, I'm not saying it's strange. Maybe it's very, very good, right? But, uh, but I think for $40 it's worth the development device if you don't have any other device, okay? So, um, if you have a choice, uh, it's better to use uh, uh, pure and pure Google devices. So this means the Nexus 4, Nexus 5, uh, Moto X, uh, Moto G, uh, these devices that used to be more supported by Google. Okay? The difference is not very large nowadays. It used to be worse once upon a time. Once upon a time, I, I, I used to run into trouble when I was using uh, uh, more of the more uh, you know uh, cheaper devices. Uh, the uh, just to give you a, a, a little bit of fun background, but the, the startup that I built this app for was doing a webcam. Uh, you, you can you can use a spare device to use as a webcam. Okay, and so since it's, uh, it had to run on spare devices, I was collecting all these uh, cheap devices that people would give me as uh, you know as uh, their leftovers, uh, or else that I could buy for twenty dollars. You know, I would score Amazon listings for the cheapest possible. And uh, we noticed a lot of funny things on these very cheap devices. For example, um, once I had a very obscure bag in which uh, some background activity was never happening. And the reason is that uh, that device, uh, they configured the OS in such a way that it had exactly one background thread. So once it was doing something in the background, it could do nothing else. You know, and they spent two hours figuring, figuring that one out. Another device uh, I had um, was wonderful, except that it didn't log anything beyond the, below the error level. So I was uh, desperately trying to, to add logging to my application to figure out why certain things were happening, and I would see exactly nothing, okay? Um, but why? Well, you know, because they configured it that way, so they could save a little bit on the storage for the log messages, I guess, okay? But of course, I was very unhappy. Um, and, and so, you know, these and many other things uh, happen uh, when you use uh, uh, non-standard devices. Basically, the manufacturers can uh, tweak the operating system uh, to their, um, you know, in the way they want. And so some things don't, don't always work in the standard way. Now, the problem is less now because as all the devices have become more powerful, you're less likely to run into a device in which they do this... Uh, you know, tweaks in order to uh, limit threading or do things like that. But you might end up in devices where if you want to, you know, do movies, the interface to the camera is a little bit different because they tweaked it in some special way because they believe that their camera is very, very special and so they have this different set of, uh, you know, options that may not be available, etc., etc. So these things happen. Uh, yeah, in, uh, so, so that's why I tell you, you know, if you don't have a device already, you know, uh, the Moto G works really well. Uh, if you do have a device already, it's fine. I really recommend a device uh, of uh, level four and post because uh, there are some, there have been, uh, um, unfortunately, some very big changes in, uh, um, in the, um, um, in the, uh, in the SDK. I mean, in the, in the software release. Uh, pre and post the, the uh, Android 4 release, okay, Android 4.0 release. 
So you will have a better experience if you use, use a later device. So um, the other thing that you need is uh, an uh, eye clicker, OK? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I chickened out. I should have really have a bit of the application for replacing the eye clickers with Android during the break. But actually, my break was, you know, was, uh, was a, a mess, like, uh, you know, a rush. And, uh, and I couldn't get it done. So I, I instead proposed that we try to replace eye clickers by writing an Android app in the class. Okay, so that will be one of the things we will be doing. But you know, I, I enlarged much more of the enrollment than I originally planned. So cut me some slack at least on trying to manage the class without reinventing everything from scratch, okay? So we will need eye clickers. And in fact, I want to use them now uh, because I want to see how, whether I can actually use them. Uh, I, I, so I want to try now um, to make a poll about uh, which device you have. Uh, I, and I'm, I think that in order to make a poll, I have to, um, so let's say uh, A, none, B, uh, B is uh, um, three uh, Android, four, C is uh, greater than the uh, equal point four point zero. And the question is, uh, uh, which Android? OK, so let's see whether this works. Start and stop polling. Let's see whether this works. Ready, go. Nothing happens. OK. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> Okay, I think I have to say, okay. Yeah. Oh, I have to click here? Okay. Yeah. Just to know where we stand with devices and, uh, I mean, I know that not all of you may have an iClicker already, but, uh, you know, try to have it for next week, uh, starting next week. <coughs> So we should have a choice uh, D that says uh, uh, I haven't got uh, I haven't gotten my eye clicker yet. No, I'm just joking. Okay, let's stop it and see. A B C. Okay, E E means you know I have no clue. Uh, I guess, uh, which is a valid reply. Um, okay, this is good actually because I think there are only two people that have a pre-Android uh, uh, for a device. Um, yeah, I don't know what to tell them. Uh, I, I think that uh, to some extent is not bad because they can really check whether the code works also on a sort of fairly old devices. <laughs> but it's it's a sort of non-optimal experience in many ways. So. Uh, you know, my recommendation would be to, to loan or borrow some, something new. Yes? How do you know you're going the same? Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, and in fact, uh, um, yeah. So you go in the settings, uh, and uh, if I go in my phone in the settings, but all the phones are different in the settings, I okay. click on about phone, and mine says Android version 4.4.4. 4. 4. Okay. Um, and this, by the way, uh, tells you another thing, that uh, they, uh, once upon a time it was very easy to develop for Android, meaning that we just needed to stick it into the computer and say that, yes, we need to use the device. Now, uh, in order to avoid the uh, people that uh, don't want to develop, you know, to be tricked into plugging their phone into some... Uh, um, so the story is this, if you enable the USB tagging, uh, and you plug the phone into a computer, and the computer has installed the uh, ADB Android, uh, uh, what is ADB? Android uh, debugging, uh, blah, blah. No, I don't know what it is. Uh, but it's essentially the boots of our computer for Android. So if you plug it in, uh, you can see in real time the logs of the Android, the logs of the phone, right? And you can also download all the logs for the last uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Typically, the logs contain a lot of confidential information. I mean, it's not super confidential, right? But it contains information about all the apps I'm, I'm running. So maybe you get to know, you know, my username on Twitter, my thing over there, my thing over here. Lots of things that generally a person should not be able to discover. So the danger of enabling uh, debugging is that uh, then I give you, uh, I go to one of these uh, hackathon conferences, I give you 
you something that looks like a charger, but behind the wall there is instead a computer, you plug your phone to charge and you don't know, suck up all your logs. And they can also install applications, by the way. You can also install APKs, okay? So for example, I can remove your Gmail APK and push to your phone an APK that looks like Gmail, but is actually my Gmail, okay? So I get a copy of the Gmail. I mean, this things you can do. Um, so, uh, so obviously, uh, Android wanted to make it a little bit harder for uh, for you to 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 do this, and so you need to Google uh, the solution for how to put an Android phone in developer mode. Okay, so we can do it here. One of the things you will notice in my class is that I forget a lot of things, and so I, you know I, I search all the time. But uh, um, Android, how to enter developer mode? Okay, and. Uh, um, yeah, open settings about software information, and then you need, need to tap the build the number seven times. You tap it seven times, and then you go in developer mode. I always I don't remember what to tap, so usually tap at random a few things until something starts happening. <laughs> but once you do it once, then you are in developer mode, and you, and, and you can use it, OK? So that is one of the things uh, uh, you can do. I mean, you need to do. OK. Um, so let me go back a moment to the to the quick facts. Um, so uh, you need a development machine. It would be great if you had a laptop, and if you didn't have a laptop, it would be great if you brought it uh, with you if it's not very convenient, so that you can actually uh, help me search for information while I try to code in real time, actually. Uh, yeah, I see people laughing because I know it all the time also from my web class, so they, they know the hang of it. Uh, and also so that, uh, you know, we can, uh, you can start actually trying the things we do in class uh, while giving the class itself. Okay, so if you can, uh, that's much better. Um, otherwise, you know, any, any other machine will do, Windows, uh, Mac, uh, Linux, uh, everything works, okay? Um, so there will be homework. There are four to five assignments graded collaboratively. This means uh, uh, both good and bad. You know, we have only two people and you have a lot of students. So we cannot grade all the homework by hand. Uh, so you will really have to grade. So essentially, you submit the homework and you grade four or five other problems. Now, this sounds really bad, but it is only actually bad. It's bad because you waste your time. It's good because you learn how to read other people's code and you see exactly how they solve the problems. Okay? And usually, there is more than one way of solving a problem. And so you can, uh, you can uh, see what other people do. Now, uh, uh, Dustin will actually check uh, how things are going. And if there is a controversy on homework uh, grading, uh, he will grade, uh, regrade a certain number himself. Uh, no? And so his grade will be the, the determining one on that one. Um, so, so there is a sort of compromise. You know? It's the only way we know to handle such large classes, actually. Um, so uh, I may also give you some uh, non-graded uh, uh, homework assignments. Uh, I mean, uh, these are really so that you can see how other people do it. But it's not really long to do it. Maybe you know a ten-minute thing, uh, so that you can try whether you can do it. And if you can, you can submit it, and you can see how other people did it. You know, just as a way for you to to try your hand at it. Uh, okay. And um, so uh, there is a project. And now let's see when I gave the class. Uh, my, one of the feedbacks I got is that the people wanted to do a, the project to have it optional, okay? Uh, so I want to make it optional, uh, and you have to write a project proposal. If it's accepted, uh, you um, get rid of the homework in the last four weeks so that you can focus on the project. The project will be the only way to get an A+, because I usually always reserve A+, for people who do really great. And, you know, I consider, you know, doing the project to be one... Uh, uh, a prerequisite of doing really great. Um, but you know, AA plus, nobody cares. The real advantage of doing the project is uh, uh, R2. Uh, one is that you learn more. And the other advantage is that when you get out of here, um, you have something to show to, to people, right? I mean, this is important in job search. Uh, and uh, I, I hear it all the time from my, from my students, you know, you know uh, your class was uh, great because then I could show, you know, it's something that you can bring in your own pocket and show when, uh, when you interview or when you talk to people. It, is, it actually works pretty well in that way. Um, and also, if I need to write letters on you, I know what to write on, right? More than if you just do homework. If you just do homework, I usually my letters will read something like, 
XYZ is a, is a very good student. He was in the top 15% of the class. He did well on the homework. And you know, I'm really glad that, that he took my class. Because I cannot say match ends. No? If you do the project, I can talk about your project. So that's the main, uh, the main uh, those are the main differences. Um, so um, uh, it's optional, it's by approval only. So I mean, you need to write a project proposal so that I check that the project is somewhat is reasonable, you know, is good. You can work in groups for the project, OK? Um, and uh, and there is no final exam. I actually would love to have some form of final exam in to write a super easy uh, but I can't because uh, if all of you have exactly the same computer, etc., etc., it would be useful. But otherwise, it would be you know, <coughs> discriminating the people who have the faster or newer laptop, the people who don't have the laptop, the people who have is completely unfeasible, right? So I really don't know how to have exams. So so I don't have them, I guess. Um, so let's see logistics attendance. Uh, I would like. Uh, so this is the first time that I make attendance compulsory uh, to at least eighty percent. There are a lot of complaints I imagine because it's early in the morning. So uh, a, a few words on this because it's a sort of you know elephant in the room. Yeah, it's early in the morning. It's early also for, for me. I actually have to wake up incredibly early for various reasons so these days that I teach. Um, so uh, it's bad. But it's also good, because actually it was uh, one of the few ways in which I could get uh, such a large room. Uh, so, you know, there is a trade-off. Uh, we all wake up early, but more of us can take the class, you know? So it's that you're doing a sort of a collective favor to, to other people. Um, and uh, last quarter, actually, I taught web, and I didn't make attendance compulsory. I also taught at 8 in the morning. And uh, um, since I, uh, my lectures are available on YouTube, Videos for you to review the code, etc. It didn't work really great. I mean, we were like how many? Twenty people in the class? Fifteen, yeah, exactly. And and I think this is really kind of uh, you know the feeling that we are all trying to learn together. You know, you do not turn around and ask your neighbor, etc. So I'm trying to make it maybe a little bit more lightweight. You know, and try to have pauses in which we actually try to solve problems in class or do things in class. But I also uh, would like you to really attend and ask questions while in class. Okay, you see, we have the videos to review, but I would like you to come. Um, okay, and, and we see how it goes. Um, office hours. So uh, <laughs> Dustin will uh, hold uh, one hour of review session a week and various hours of, uh, um, of office hours. I will also have office hours, okay? But so we will have a false uh, on Piazza or on Doodle, but anyway, the links will be on Piazza for when to hold these office hours and make sure that you can at least come to one and maybe better if you, I mean, give your preference, right? So that, uh, uh, so that we, um, um, so that we try to schedule them well. Uh, let's use Piazza for all questions that are not personal. But right? I mean that, you know, if you want to tell me, uh, look, I fell from my bike, you know, I'm here uh, with, with a, a twisted and a strange barista, and I cannot plan to get a customer. And this is all right on Piazza. But, uh, uh, but if you have a question that is technical, even if it's only you, write it on Piazza, because it's never really on the you. I mean, these are places uh, such as you know, Android Studio did this funny thing, and uh, now I don't know how to recover. You may be the only one that writes it, but there may be other five people who don't write it, but then that have exactly the same problem. Yeah? It happens very, very often, OK? Um, so uh, this also goes together with, with a bit of the collaboration policy. I usually have a fairly liberal collaboration policy. So you can copy code from the web. Uh, because everything is open source. So does. I mean, even developers. <laughs> I mean, that's how you develop. You take, you take some piece of code that actually works, and then you you can make it the shape you, know, you want, right? And you can provide by the license of the code, but that's the way people do. So you can do it. Uh, just give me the reference of where you take the code from, right? So the reference means, you know, you put a comment and you give me the URL of where the code comes from. So it is very useful, by the way, putting the reference. So when you wonder later on why you wrote things that way because you don't remember writing it, it's because you, now you can say, oh, yeah, it's because I really didn't write it, you know? And then, you know, we have to look for more explanation. Yeah? 
are we allowed to copy off bits and pieces from each other? Yes, you are allowed to copy bits and pieces from each other, but the, they have to be bits and pieces. So, so you cannot copy the wholesale thing. But for, but, but for example, suppose that I say, you know, I cannot get, uh, you will get to know that list views are a particularly bad or something. And I, you know, I can tell you, I cannot get this list view to work. How did you initialize it? And you can very well send me the four lines uh, that uh, in the initialization. In fact, you will not be, you should not be surprised that uh, on the answer to see people that post their code in the homework and that's what's not working. Okay, this is uh, fine. I mean, you cannot post like 50 lines. But if you post uh, the five, six lines where something funny is happening and you don't figure it out, that's uh, entirely all right. Uh, I'm essentially, you know, since we are so many, we have to be effective. And I'm essentially giving a, a lot more of the benefit uh, uh, to you learning and discussing the code and seeing a lot of examples rather than, you know, measuring it. There, there are these two options. One is, you know, teach, uh, having you learn, and the other one is measuring how good you are. And between the two, I think my error has always been that I prefer to have you learn. I'm not, I'm less interested in super well measuring how good you are, in some sense. Why? Because I think uh, that in the long view of your formula is here, you know, at the end of the good ones will be great and the not so good ones, you know, will, uh, will uh, suffer if they have been lazy, right? And, uh, and it's not really my job to lessen the learning experience of anyone by making it well. I mean, there is a way of teaching, as you all understand. And uh, so I, I'm traditionally not incredibly worried. I, I'd rather that you have fun and learn. Uh, so, but still, I don't want you, you know, to to wholesale, uh, you know, ship each other solutions. This is not okay. Instead, okay. The other thing that I have to tell you that I, uh, you know, among these likes and dislikes, the one thing I really don't like is a lot of analysis to some people. Is the people who ask the questions of the answer without providing any detail. It's not that they want to, you know, you know, read their neck. Uh, but it's only that you know I think that they're, they're essentially wasting time, uh, not my time. Uh, so if you post questions, uh, try to provide some detail. There are a lot of people who are too lazy to, to, to write the detail. For example, they say, hey, professor, uh, uh, I uh, try to display a string, uh, but, uh, but nothing shows up. And, you know, that works. I don't think I need to give me the code. So I would like, in that case, to see the code that I need to display the string, and the code where it's defined where the string should end up on the screen. If you don't give me some elements, uh, uh, the question I uh, asking the question is not useful. So the one thing I ask is to make an effort when you ask the question of the answer to give enough uh, 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 enough uh, context for the question to be useful. Okay, um, and I know it's difficult because sometimes you know when I work with others, I also am tempted, especially when it's uh, you know late in the day, to you know jot down my question rather than taking the time to, uh, to actually give us the context because it takes time, okay? So, but, but really try not to do that. Uh, so try to give the information that is uh, necessary. Um, I don't know if there is anything else uh, to, be, uh, to be said. I mean, usually you had a very long introduction to this class, but uh, uh, one of my problems is that the more I teach, the more I, instead of doing longer things, I could, the more I condense them. And so, uh, and so I don't know what to say uh, else than, uh, than to start uh, maybe uh, uh, getting more into the class material. Is, are there any questions at this point uh, about the general organization? Eh? Yes? For the project option, the working groups are still done. You can do a reader. Okay. Yes. Yeah. For the project, would it be required to use it? Yes. And it will be particularly easy though, because uh, there, is a, there is a very nice situation in Android Super and Git um, that will make it very easy to start. But it will be nice to class. Uh, yeah, it will be much easier. So I, but I really want to use people who use Git. I mean, on the project, I can measure it. On the homework, I can only recommend uh, that you use it, and I will show you how to use it. So. This is uh, uh, one, of, one of my sort of basics while teaching the class. Essentially, it would be nice if when you came out of this system, you were not only you know, good in theory, but you also didn't have to really develop them. And if you, if you go in any place where you get to really develop them, uh, there is no other way to collaborate with people than using the details and other versions of the system. You know, the sending each other zip balls of code or files using Dropbox just doesn't exist. Outside of a, of a sort of university undergraduate setting, probably. 
Uh, and so it's good if you learn it. Uh, and I will spend a little bit of time showing you how I use it. Uh, um, and I, uh, I require you to use it. On the homework, I cannot measure it because you know I, I cannot open every homework and check that there is a git that contains something. Uh, but uh, but I highly recommend it. Why? So one reason is that you know uh, it will be very important for you to go out and do something, even if you do research. By the way, not only if you go into industry, even if you do research. Uh, for uh, for a long time, uh, I uh, I used uh, I mean I always used the virtual photo systems in which I search for the following purpose. If you are a chemist, uh, um, they have this beautiful tradition of the lab books. So you write you know exactly what you prepared, how, and then you write the experiment you did uh, and the results, and so you can reproduce it two years afterwards if you need, right? Uh, even if you are a bio biologist, they have these lab books. And uh, for a long time, I was doing all these experiments on uh, on data, and in fact, I still do all these experiments. And so you have the data, and now you wonder how did you get those results? And uh, one of the easy solutions is to tag the results with a version of the code that actually produced them. So because at this time you will have changed all your algorithms, no, because you tweaked them. And so they don't produce that data anymore. And so if after six months you need to reproduce your results, so the only way is really to use version control systems and know that you know that that's what produced those results. So I think that version control is essential for uh, uh, for industry, for uh, for academia, uh, and also for your sanity. You know, there are uh, you think you are lucky, but there are always these people. So there are two phenomena. One is uh, uh, the data is approaching. You do one last thing and you break everything. And you don't know how, and you cannot even go back to the last version that kind of worked. It, this is very, I mean, it's super stressful. And the other equally difficult thing that happens to me regularly is I do something and I break, and I break the stuff. And I have no clue why I broke it. And if I had to start from scratch, knowing why I broke it, it would be extremely difficult. But luckily, I versioned the code so I can look at the difference. And I know that what broke it must be one of the things I changed. Okay, and this incredibly narrows down the the scope of uh, what I have to think about when I when I look for the bug. And I've had uh, bugs that I would never have found otherwise because sometimes I broke things by, um, you know, removing a, uh, an end of the line comma from a file to which I was not paying attention because uh, you know while drinking coffee I was I, I, I pressed backspace where I was not not careful. You know, uh, it, it, it's not only that, not always the case that what you break, uh, that you break things are uh, doing major work. Sometimes it's the side work that breaks it. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, so really you use a uh, version control. Um, okay. What else to say? <coughs> so, um, one of the difficulties for me for teaching this class is this. Every year I teach it, I think I know something about it, um, but the situation changes under my feet. Okay? And, uh, and this is true also this year. So, up to in the previous three times, I used uh, Eclipse uh, for developing for Android. It was a recommended solution. Okay? Uh, Eclipse has, uh, Eclipse is this development environment for Java. I think it was started at IBM and then open source, uh, and I really like it. Not only for Java, I use it even for Python. I use it a lot. Uh, as people who work with who have taken my other classes know. Uh, but uh, uh, while Eclipse is very uh, works uh, fairly well and is very mature for Android, uh, it's not going to be supported in the future. So the future support uh, in Google decided to. So I put it all on Android Studio. Okay, so Android Studio is a new de de development environment uh, for, for Android. Uh, the problem is that, uh, uh, you know, since all my legacy applications that I wrote, uh, I wrote them under Eclipse, uh, I've not had a lot of occasion as far to use Android Studio. So I actually have to learn it together with you, okay? I'm sorry, I will be quite clumsy, but it's the most important thing is this. Uh, if you get into some kind of obscure trouble in Android Studio, I'm not sure I'm able to be out of trouble. Okay? I mean, I can try, but, but you know, I, I don't know it inside out as I do it uh, Do you know it inside out? No. Okay. Does anybody know it inside out? No, nobody. Uh, the, the true story is that I wanted to use it when I go. It was not very mature, uh, and uh, it had some 
glitches, uh, you know, everybody is sensitive to particular things, and it has some glitches that really don't have me nuts. Uh, I couldn't stand, stand it. For example, you know, you could import a project, uh, but you could not, never delete a project, remove it. And since I had all these projects done in Eclipse and I was trying to move them to Android Studio, I was having all these broken projects in front of me and I couldn't remove them. I simply, you know, had a fit and then I, I, I stopped using it. And now it's much more stable. Uh, it's actually very nice. Uh, it, it's actually nicer in many respects, including it's easier to manage and to install it. Uh, it's just that I've been using it for a much shorter time. So, you know, we, I hope that, uh, you know, we don't get into some deep trouble. Um, but I recommend that you use Android Studio because it's uh, for two reasons. One, it's the, what will be newly supported from now on. And second, because it makes uh, uh, the installation or, on your laptop of uh, or computer of all the development tools much easier. The problem with Eclipse is that Eclipse is very general purpose. So you have to install Eclipse, and then you have to install bits and pieces that went into Eclipse. And uh, then once this was all done, you had to update all these bits and pieces separately, you know, and each one had their own. Uh, and, you know, it was quite easy to go out of sync uh, with uh, the latest version of to be missing some piece, etc. So in Android Studio, you download that and you essentially are all set. Uh, it's, it's a much easier experience in many ways, okay? Uh, and, and it has other advantages as well. So, you know, better, you, better UI for, uh, for laying out the things uh, graphically on the screen. Uh, of the device, uh, so uh, so I recommend that you try to install it, okay? And and today we show you how to uh, how to use it uh, in a, in a, building a simple app. Uh, so this is for Android Studio, and uh, and then I want to tell you generally some things about you know developing the development for mobile. Um, uh, questions so far. Eh? So you need to install Android Studio, yes. So you mentioned it's one of the possible projects to be replacing the iClicker system. Now, are we talking about something that completely replaces iClicker, or are we talking about something that's actually going to be interfacing with the iClicker system for the Android device? No, I'm uh, replacing it, because I don't know how to interface to the iClicker, and I don't think that we'd be very happy if we did that. Uh, so, uh, but the server portion, you know, we can wing it or do it easily. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't, you know, you can do it easily and badly, right? And and, uh, um, and uh, the Android portion is a little bit of fun because it tells, you know, we, we can play with it. But I don't know if I will be serious with it, right? I want to play with it. It's a very nice uh, uh, thing with which to play to give a few examples of code, I guess. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's why I still want the physical like clickers because uh, I want something that is guaranteed to work so that we can play with something else. Let's put it that way. Okay? Uh, and, you know, I might give it as a homework to, uh, you know, uh, you press on the buttons, you submit your solution, uh, you do this and that, etc. So this will be a, one of the possible homework assignments. Um, questions or... So I would recommend that you try to install a Android Studio for next time, if you haven't already. Okay, it shouldn't be very complicated. There are links. Oh yes, another thing. I try to put most information on the class web page. Okay. So um, so in the resources you can find uh, the Android Studio uh, download page and installation. Okay. There is no textbook. Um, the, the last thing we had a textbook that I was advising, uh, but not it, it wasn't compulsory. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't think it was uh, value added enough for me to really advise it. So if you want to get it, it's a very nice textbook. You look at last year's class. Uh, it's not a bad book. I wouldn't be. I won't be following it very closely. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, I sort of developed my own idea about what is important and what is secondary in Android, and so I, I have a slightly different point of view, I guess, than the book. But the book is very good, and it gives you a different perspective, so I think you, you can still get it and learn from it. Um, it's only that so much material is available online that it seems a bit pointless to tell you to get an eye clicker and a phone and a book. No, I mean, we have to cut somewhere. Um, okay? Um, and that's it. 
Okay, so developing from Android, the first uh, thing that you may uh, wonder is why do you need to develop from Android at all? Meaning, uh, um, why can't we just build web pages? Okay, and in fact, uh, by the way, you are an expert about uh, HTML5 and all these things. So I think I'll tap on the TA uh, for, a, for a lecture maybe on how to uh, not build for Android. Okay, usually I give it, but I think you might be better at it. Uh, for, uh, at least it will, it will be more funny if you agree, okay? I'm putting it, uh, you on the spot. Uh, by the way, uh, since I put him on the spot, let me put everybody on the spot. So, uh, I don't know. There's a huge amount of things to be known for developing for Android. Some of you are being students, some know incredibly well how to do it. Some of you maybe, I don't know, uh, things on digital media students are know incredibly well how to do this and that. So, uh, if you want to give uh, uh, a tutorial in class uh, from length of about 20 minutes to half an hour or whatever length you like, you can write to me a tutorial proposal. And that will come instead of a homework. Okay? So that's uh, the back thing. So if you can be say, what you want to talk about and you give me some work of what you'll be saying, yeah, you get a help of a homework. And the same thing, you know, you, you get to uh, you know, you have fun. Um, because uh, we can all learn you know, these things from people who really know them rather than from trying to learn them represent them. Okay? I mean, I know some things, but not. It, it's very wide uh, what, what you can do with uh, these devices. Okay? So think at it. Uh, um, if you want to present something in class, uh, it would be very nice. For example, I'm not an expert about, particularly about animations. I mean, I know how to do simple animations. Uh, um, but I know that this is a super incredible expert, uh, expert about animations. Uh, so if you have in mind some topic that is of interest to you, uh, you know, let me know. Um, but the first uh, thing is, uh, why do you need to develop for Android? You know? Why can't you simply use the web? Um, in fact, you can use the web, right? A lot of things to do with the, the phone are done the access to the web. But it's not a, uh, it, it's not a universal solution. Um, yeah, and uh, I think you're all aware that you know Facebook at the beginning was doing the app with the HTML5, and then they have to redo it natively. So why do people do apps uh, natively rather than developing HTML5 for our platforms and be done with it? Okay. So first of all, why would it be nice to use HTML5? Well, because uh, um, if you want to have an app in the store, uh, there is a way to take. Uh, uh, a web page, wrap it in a thing called a web feed, and make it become an application. In fact, you can do it even better. Okay? There, there are tools such as uh, Apache Cordova, which is, I think, what you might be wanting to present, right? PhoneGap has become Apache Cordova, yes. I can, uh, otherwise, I can also give you examples of Apache Cordova. But essentially, um, you write your HTML5 code. Okay? And this HTML5 code, then Apache Cordova is able to take it and wrap it inside an app for Android, for uh, iOS, for Mac, for Windows. So you essentially can write once and not the app store the platform. Okay? I will explain, we will cover later in the class how to do that. Okay? It's a very effective strategy um, if you, uh, if you you know, just want to have, uh, for example, it would be a good strategy for the clickers, if you will, you know, because then we could have them running on all possible mobile devices. Um, what is the drawback? Uh, one, of the, one of the drawbacks may be a bit of responsiveness. Okay, so if you are native, it's a little bit faster. Uh, especially things like swiping and drawing, uh, you know, these kind of interactions are faster. A bigger difference, and this is really my opinion, okay, but a bigger difference is that the web and mobile essentially think of the UI of the, of the user interaction in a very, very different way. The web thinks uh, that you, you have essentially a big hole on a larger reality. No? Your browser window is, is a port hole, a viewport, on something that is bigger. And then you can scroll the web page behind the viewport. Okay, that is uh, how the web has been designed. So a lot of the things that you do on the web that may look like an app, but are really done in absolutely horrible ways, from the point of view of counterintuitive ways. For example, suppose that you have uh, um, suppose that you have a rectangle, okay, and that you want a bar, a, a bar to appear and disappear. 
often this is done by having the bar, you, you move it to negative x, so that it's off the screen. Okay, and, and then you move this offset from negative x to, to you know, to zero x, so that it enters the screen. So, you know, you have the viewport on the bigger reality, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, so I see that so that when they load photographs, you know, they to them on the web, but what do they do? They load the images, go there, like, you know, Shafarnaim or whatever, you know, with a big offset. So that they are loaded in this new part, the user is never able to score that file, right? Because of what they saw. And when then, you know, they just change the opposite of the image and put in the image and have this immediately, right? And so that's really this, uh, this is a sort of entrenched point of view that you have, you are looking at reality through a view part. Uh, in mobile, instead, the idea is very different. The idea is that uh, this is your screen and, and you can decide exactly how things move on the screen. But it's very easy to, uh, to leave things uh, where they are if you don't want them to move. No, it's very easy to place them very accurately uh, uh, with respect to the screen boundary and leave them there. Okay? Um, let's, let's give a simple example. Uh, at some point, actually, we did a lot of metal settings on the this is quite common. We did a lot of these apps that don't show you family, but you can also scroll. And we have some battles at the bottom. And the, the difficult thing is that then you scroll, and as you scroll, the battles go up as well, right? Because that's part of the page. I mean, you're looking at this surface, so when you scroll, you change the viewport, and then it moves. You know? so, so the battles would start to, to, you know, when you scroll up, the, the battles would flow down. You know? And then the JavaScript was taking the battles and we put in them back at the bottom. Horrible. And then, you know, the next step is sophistication is that to say, no, this is silly. So when the scroll starts, you, you make the battle see visible. And when the scroll stops, you make them visible again. Because, uh, but you cannot be the you know, scroll and leave the battle see in the same place. Uh, okay? So these are the kind of differences that make it very hard in the end, in my opinion, to, to obtain such seamless apps for mobile than with the HTML5 as they are with the mobile development. Okay, so the mobile development gives you environment, gives you much better primitives for really uh, making sure that your your touch and your your um, your use interaction has the intended effect on you. That is, in my opinion, the, the the main difference. I also have to say that it's a bit unfortunate uh, in many respects that uh, that you cannot do everything with HTML5 because. Uh, um, as we will see, developing for uh, mobile is quite laborious. Okay, it's much less effective, in my opinion, than developing for a new in, in a mix of HTML and JavaScript. Okay, so the the benefit is that you look in Java, so you have a type system. Uh, so when you compile, you have some guarantee that things stay together, unlike in JavaScript. And, uh, uh, and you also, you know, there's some guarantee that when you modify your code later on, you don't break it entirely in subtle ways that you don't know about. Okay, so that is the advantage. The drawback is that you need to write a lot more code. Okay, Java is verbose. Uh, Android is even more verbose. Okay, so uh, there are, um, uh, I spent a few months on a year in the early version of that, and it was something that brought me up the wall, frankly. Because, uh, um, there were things that I would think were very easy to do that I think in JavaScript and HTML would have taken me 20 lines of code and they ended up writing 400 lines of Java to get that done. There are, you know, there, there is sometimes very little correlation between how silly and small the feature seems to you and uh, how maddening it is to actually get it done in the right way. Okay, so, so it, it, it's a nice way to say. So I think that somebody should really come and and built on top of Android a framework, the, uh, you know, why is the web easy? Once upon a time, the web was really difficult to develop for. Uh, you know, I witnessed the early, you know, PHP uh, tools, uh, like, you know, try to open the squirrel, squirrel mail code base in PHP and be happy, you know, it, it's a mess. Um, but, uh, uh, but then, you know, people came, uh, you know, they looked at what other people used of in web development, and they made this framework that made it, make it much more pleasant to develop. And I think uh, Android is right for such a, for such a thing, for, for somebody uh, building such a, uh, such a framework. I mean, 
Um, if you want to cheat that, I have a little bit of fun with that. You can go and uh, search for um, app inventor. In fact, I can do it for you. Okay. This is something used for kids uh, that is actually fun to use. Okay. So. Okay, so you, this is a way in which you can develop for Android, and the, the code is, uh, where, uh, sorry, uh, it's sometimes that I haven't used it. Where is the code? But the code is uh, scratch-like. Hey, where is the code? Thank you. Okay, so this was code that I was doing. Okay, so now this is a this is a bit uh, you know uh, actually it's used to teach uh, you know people in high school etc. And it's very nice actually. You can develop your Android app and using the Scratch plus a very simplified UI, and you you can do things that are very sophisticated. You know. Uh, I don't know, uh, I saw people in that case in which uh, uh, you click to the phone and uh, your character goes around and has to work for a maze and then they log off the other of the maze. Uh, I've seen people with uh, apps, you know, this can send SMS, this can SMS, the key voice to leave, and you can do very sophisticated stuff. And so, uh, you know, this uh, Scratch program here says, when speech recognizer one, after getting text, do this. So this calls the speech recognizer one, gets the text, and then, you know, it does something with the text. And it takes, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10 square inches of my screen. Uh, now, if, if you have to use uh, the Google API for doing the same, I haven't looked at it, but basically any API you, you need to use, it seems that, you know, less than 50 lines of code and you're back. But it's more likely, I mean, it's usually some, uh, uh, some very obscure, even to use the camera, it's some very obscure mambo jumbo that you have to copy. And uh, you will see that the desperation of developing for Android is that uh, there are two. One is that there is inconsistent documentation. You say, I want to use the camera. How do I use the camera? You think that there's no place that they should have to use the camera. And this is true, but it's not quite true. Uh, there is a place of this you have to use the camera. In fact, there are many places, but I'm going to change. And so all these places tell you something slightly different. Okay? Uh, and then you have to try which of those versions of code actually works for you. Okay? And some of them will work and some of them will not. And some of them are in the field, so they tell you how to do something, but they don't tell you how to plug it into the rest of the job. And so, uh, you know, I found myself to do a lot of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, Comparison between many sites in order to find how to do something. You look at the Android documentation, uh, you look at this, you look at that. The Android documentation itself is sometimes inconsistent because it often documents an earlier version. I mean, not the code of the documentation, but the tutorials. And this is, uh, by the way, one of the big fallacies in code. People tell you, ah, you have to document your code. And people believe that by documenting your code, you need to essentially write what methods do. And uh, okay, fine. But the real way you document your code is by giving working examples. Okay, nobody wants to learn how to use an Android camera by reading the instructions of the end methods you have available to you to call. Because the problem is that you don't even know which methods you need to call, right? Is uh, the, the problem? Is the real way to document these things is that you give a working example of how to call the camera. You know how to initialize it, how to take a picture, store it, and then process it. No. And, uh, and so these examples, unlike uh, the documentation of the methods, are not necessarily kept up to date. And so you will see that you know, this is one of the main headaches of developing for Android. And so uh, you know, this, this framework here is incredibly powerful compared to developing for Android. And uh, you know, this shows you how ripe for disruption is uh, uh, the development itself. OK? Um, OK, fine. Um, enough, uh, uh, enough talking about generic things. Uh, I want to uh, make a very short break, uh, and then I want to uh, actually start building a simple application to show you what it takes. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yes, uh, I, I will, uh, I will we make a form for, uh, for people now to reach out. Okay, yeah, yeah, I had the same. Part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, ask me during class if I forget, but I will make a form and I will post it on Piazza. Okay. So I just want to gather, you know, how many people there are in the waiting list. There shouldn't be too many problems, I think. Okay? Sure. Yeah. So I think you said during class, It's okay, but it will be very fast. It's a uh, lot of Java. Okay? So that's the trouble. That, uh, it, you need to write a lot of code. So it's a sort of non. Um, hundreds of lines for homework is typical. I mean, it's, uh, because it's very verbose and very, there is a lot of stuff to do. So. That's the only drawback. I mean, I did a synthesis, you know, nobody taught me Java, actually. And so I just self-taught myself Java by me. So you can do it, yeah. It's just that it's going to be a bit tougher. Yeah? But, I mean, the good part is that we don't use very obscure parts of Java. We don't use, you know, this crazy stuff about uh, multiple inheritance and these tricky things that sometimes can happen. We just, you know, need to turn out a lot of code. So maybe it's not as hard as it seems. It's not hard from the problem. Uh, 
So yeah, the studio and stuff is all installed. But at the bottom here, it says uh, you can like add additional SDK packages. I'm wondering if I need any of that or does the default stuff cover everything that we use? Um, you need to check that you have these SDK tools. Okay? okay. And I think I need to check myself actually, but I think I may have them. But okay. you know, you because there's already a lot that comes. Check, yeah. um, that's when I first downloaded it. I yeah. also ran an update that downloaded a ton of like additional stuff. Yeah, so, so I'm just so wondering I, if that already really covered everything. I ha haven't needed to do anything like that, actually. Oh. But, uh, but I think, uh, so how do you do it? Eh? This is my Android Studio. Can you tell me how to check uh, Android? Uh, it was the first time that I launched it. It says there's an update available. And it yeah. just, I just said, sure, go ahead. And it just downloaded a ton of stuff and automatically. Yeah, but I think I'm also OK. OK. So it probably did it for you. It, too. I think it did it automatically. Okay. And you yes, haven't uh, had to download anything additional, right? No, but it also downloaded a bunch of stuff at the beginning. Yes. Right, exactly. Okay, so like, I should uh, be fine. Yeah, I okay. think you're fine. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, you're fine. If you can build, you're fine. No, no, but I'm just asking. Uh, OK. OK, uh, just as a curiosity, so many people that are asking for permission for uh, and you know, since we have a bigger room, I can give out the sound. I will post a, a form of Piazza that will ask you about your name and why you need it because there are many different permission codes nowadays. Nowadays, but uh, can I would just want a quick poll to know how many of you would like to, I'm not not enrolled and would like to enroll. If you are one of those people, sorry, uh, please uh, press A, and don't press anything if you are already enrolled and you are fine. I just want to take a very quick count of how many people need a, need a permission code for one reason or another. Right. OK, fine. You're right. OK, let's cancel the call. <laughs> mental, uh, mental short circuit, OK? OK, so I was uh, talking to some students uh, uh, before. Uh, one thing that I want to tell you about talking for Android. Um, yeah, so one of the important things is that we have to write a lot of Java code. So I hope that all of you will, uh, will be confident in that writing Java. The good part of it is that uh, you don't need to know any one of these very obscure things about Java um, that uh, uh, you know, would be all inheritance in very crazy ways or all uh, of these very complicated things. So you need a very plain uh, program code in the seeds. Uh, but you just need to be able to code <coughs> with uh, understanding and dealing with a lot of code, more than in a normal uh, uh, class, I would say, even though I don't be in your classes. No, but uh, certainly more than in my web class. Okay. I think uh, for the people who have taken my web class, uh, the ratio of code from this to that is a factor of four at least. Uh, just because, you know, here everything takes more code. Um, okay? So. Let's uh, let's uh, show how to build an app in Android Studio and talk about uh, what are the various pieces of it. So you download Android Studio. Here is Android Studio. I, I don't like this I clicker thingy. A moment. Ah. OK. And uh, this is a project that I have already created, but I show you how to create a new one. Uh, uh, OK, so I say new project. I can call it uh, uh, like uh, class uh, uh, one, uh, okay? And so you you have to use a company domain, which uh, which can be any um, any uh, domain. It doesn't need to exist, of course, right? So you can call it whatever you want, um, and then you need to decide where where the project is on on uh, on disk, okay? So then you have to decide. Um, for which APKs uh, to, uh, I mean, what is the minimum SDK to use uh, when you start a project? Yes. Yes. Also, let me actually go back and tell you one thing about the previous page. Yes. Where are the spotlights? This, uh, yeah. Better? OK. So, um, there is actually a very nice post by someone, uh, and you can find it by searching for Android, what should not change? No, sorry, what cannot change? 
um, things that cannot change, okay? And there is this uh, Android developer here that wrote uh, this very nice blog post about things that you need to choose at the beginning and it will be hard to change uh, later, okay? So these are things that when you start a new project, uh, you have to pay attention to. It's maybe worth reading uh, this blog post, okay? Yeah, I can, but not... Not now, I guess, so uh, if I remember. Okay, I'll leave it open and, uh, and I'll post it on Piazza. And one of the things you cannot change is uh, um, the company domain and the application name, because together they give you this package name. Okay, this package name is not very user-useful, but it's essentially, you know, when you have an application and, uh, and, and, and auto updates, okay? So how do you, does Android know that this is a new copy of that in there? Okay, essentially the package name is what dominates. So once you put an application in the store with a certain package name, you cannot change it. Otherwise, people who have the older version of the app will never be auto-updated to the new version of the app. Okay, you essentially lose them. Okay, so if you choose a silly name, or if you choose a suboptimal name, you are stuck. Okay, and it's visible sometimes. I was beat by it, you know, when the application I wrote, I mean, it, it's not a silly name, but it has a, like a, 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, one of these silly names that contains, you know, some, some prefix because it was one of the end versions I was playing around with, and then, then it got stuck in the official package name that I'm distributing. So, you know, that's too bad, I guess. So, but that's one of the things that cannot change. Um, Another thing that, you can, that cannot change is the security certificate, but we will talk about that later, okay? Uh, then you have to choose the minimum SDK. This can change. So, essentially, one of the curses of developing for Android is that uh, in some ways Android is a new Windows. You know, there are all these uh, devices around, and they are all different. Some of them are old, some of them are new, and you try to support as many of them as possible. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's the most difficult thing to do when you develop for Android. But so here you have to choose, uh, essentially, how old is the oldest uh, Android that, that you would support, okay? And uh, there are some, uh, some very big differences. I think that uh, uh, I, I don't have a place where to write. I, I wish they had a board on the side. But I think that the pre-2.2 is uh, prehistoric, essentially. And it works uh, very different in many respects. Uh, then there is a 2.3, um, Android 2.3, uh, so these numbers here, okay, uh, 4.0.3 corresponds to 15. The integer is the way Android reads on and the 4.0.3 is the user-facing name, and there is a one-to-one -to -one correspondence between them, okay? So I think that if I remember correctly, the integer being beyond a, below a, is very solid. Eight and nine, and there are some devices. Then there is a little bit of a gap, but and from 11 on are fairly modern devices, okay? So I think we can actually look at them. Uh, you see, um, nine is the first one that I consider very, very mod modern, okay? Uh, if you just want to support 4.0 devices, you go to 14 or 15, okay? So if you go to 15, they tell you, Google tells you that there are 90% of the devices that run that. So it must be, it's becoming rarer and rarer to find all the devices. So people are now moving to supporting only uh, APKs from, um, I mean, uh, uh, SDK from, uh, from 15 onwards, okay? This is a decision that you can revisit, but it's a little bit painful to revisit. Because essentially, the problem is that if you start building a project using new stuff that is not available on old phones, then you are left with the question of how to, what to do on the old phones. Do you write alternate code that runs only from the old phones, or do you, or what exactly do you do? Okay, so this is a, um, um, a complicated decision. In practice for the class, I, I would tell you to use a API, in my opinion, 15 is good, actually. You get most of the modern devices. Um, okay, then, uh, uh, then you need to decide what to show on the screen at the beginning. And uh, this is extremely useful because uh, it, it builds some boilerplate code for you. Um, you can have a blank activity, which is uh, the default choice. So in Android, uh, the activity is uh, 
the class and the code that backs a screen for you. Okay? So uh, each time you have a screen, for example, think at Gmail, you have one list of all your emails. Okay? Then if you click on an email, you have another thing that displays that is uh, you know the email with the buttons to reply. Okay? Any one of those screen foods that in web development would be web pages as a software, but any one of those is called an activity. Okay? And it's made out of a UI. I mean, it's made out of a, uh, of a file that describes how to lay out the screen. So, uh, and this helps you get started by having the right skeleton, okay? So there is a blank activity, a blank activity with fragment, which I don't advise you to do at the beginning. We will talk, talk about fragments later. Uh, full screen, maps, uh, you have various choices. But for the moment, uh, let's start with a blank one, okay? Um, we have to give it a name. I always call the main activity, main activity, because it's, uh, why not, you know? And uh, this is building for us uh, the new activity. The new application, really. So it takes a moment. And it usually prints a little bit of garbage at the beginning because it's trying to show us the application while it's still building it. You can see that it's still So after a while, it's built, and, and then we have it. So let's look at the various pieces. Um, so we have the main activity.xml file. This is uh, the layout file that describes what to put on the screen. It's the equivalent of the HTML code. Actually, I find it much more pleasant to work with uh, because uh, I think the layout uh, ideas are better in Android. You know, it came later, so it's more uh, sort of adapted to the format of the screen. But so there is an H uh, XML file, and you can display it as visually, like in this way, or you can display it as text. This is the text. Is the font all right, or should I use a smaller font or bigger font? Smaller font? <coughs> bigger. No, OK, there is no, no consensus. I think it's kind of OK. Um, so, so this is the XML file that describes uh, this. And you can work visually here, or you can work on the XML file. And I, we typically do both, right? You, you, you put something on the screen, you tweak it a little bit, then you switch to the XML view and you tweak it some more, okay? So, but the, this is the activity main XML. Corresponding to it, there is a main activity.java, okay? So this is a Java file that executes and, and is the code backing that screen full. And it works in this way. So an, uh, an, uh, uh, the main activity, extends action bar activity. So welcome to Java, no? There is an incredibly complex series of uh, uh, class inheritance in, in Android, okay? But essentially, if you forget these various details, uh, the activities are all subclasses of activity. Activity is a class, okay? And uh, this action bar activity is one of the n plus one flavors of this activity class. It's an activity class that will have an action bar somewhere, and who cares what it is, and we, you don't worry about it. Okay, something like that. Okay, so um, what what is uh, very important is that this is an activity, and uh, an activity uh, needs to contain some methods that are called to bring it to life. Okay, so one of the fundamental things, and I think I have a slide to show you, but otherwise I'll fish it out of the documentation, is this. What happens when you open an application and you uh, land on a page? Okay, the phone is doing the following. The phone is uh, reading uh, at the same. Uh, it, it's uh, reading this. Uh, sorry. There is a file somewhere hidden here, and I still need to uh, to learn how to navigate these things well. Hold on. No. Hey, where is the, ah, here. 
So there is this Android manifest file, okay? So what is inside an application? Uh, uh, it, it's like, you know, if you have a crate and you ship a crate, you put a, a piece of paper that says what works inside of the crate, okay? And so that's the piece of paper, essentially. It tells you what is inside of the application from the outside point of view. So this tells you that the package is called Comdel Favo Luca class one, okay? This is the application, and the application has many activities. One of them is called main activity. There is a label that is called class one that is simply, you know, what appears at the top when you, when you run it. It's not very important. But then what this tells you, with these two lines are very important, that tells you in some way that this is the activity to launch at the beginning. So when you click on, on an application, Android does the following. The operating system does the following, essentially. It says, ah, you want to open that thing. So let's go look in the manifest, and let's look at what do I actually have to launch. And if the activity has this uh, thing, this couple of lines here that says that it's main launcher, this means that it, it's the thing that actually has to appear first when you start your application. Okay, so that's the way in which you say, um, because if you can have, uh, like in a website, uh, but uh, your application can have many activities, right? It can have many screens. You have to decide what happens when you launch it initially. Okay, the way you decide is in the manifest. And it's the first activity you create, typically. Okay, so, so what happens in Android when you launch this main activity? What happens is this. This is a, the, a, every activity is a class, okay? So main activity is a class that extends action bar activity, that extends something else, that in the end, end extends activity. So Android thinks, hmm, okay, great, I have this main activity class, now I need to create an object of this class, and this object is what will, uh, you know, give rise to the behavior you have in front of your eyes, okay? So it creates an object of this class, it does a few things behind your back, you know, when, when you don't look, because it you know, initializes the methods of the parent class and whatever else before telling you anything, you know, blanks the screen, whatever it needs to do. But then it will call the onCreate method of the activity. Okay, so there is a guarantee that when, you're, when your object is created, the onCreate method is called first. And so there you can do things that you want to do when you are first given the opportunity to run. Okay, so what do we do in this code? <coughs> what we do in this code is this. We do this uh, super on create uh, that I always love thinking at Superman, I don't know why, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's simply a mambo jumbo that does something that you are not interested in. Uh, so just copy it and you will be fine. But the other thing that you do is this. You say set content view r.layout.activity main. So uh, this means, uh, um, when I come alive, please set on the screen as the view of uh, my content this uh, r.layout.activity main, which is a reference to this activity main. So essentially, the code is saying, hey, please take this activity main XML file and use it as the layout of what you have to show me in front of my notes. Okay? If I want that there, I mean, it's not a very common thing to do, but suppose that I had a, a, if I wanted, I could pick a random number, and based on the random number, I could execute one of many of these set content view uh, uh, statements, and so I could show you one of many different initial views. I, uh, you know, it's not typically done in this way, but, but it's something you can do. So that's really the point where you decide what to show, okay? Uh, the other two things uh, that are defined for you on create options menu, on, on uh, options menu selected, these are done to deal with the menu button. And you can safely disregard them. Just, you know, don't bother them for a while. Okay, we will come to menus afterwards. Okay, so what this page does at the beginning is exactly this. When, when, when the activity is created, it sets it to the, the screen to the XML file, and that's it. And it does not run any other code ever since. Okay, that's all it will ever do. The only thing it will ever do. So, um, now, here is, uh, uh, here is the view, you know, there is this hello world that is super small, and in fact, I don't like it, and I remove it, okay? So, let me uh, give you a little bit of introduction to, to how to lay out here. So, 
there are various uh, concepts uh, in uh, laying out of the screen. There are layouts and there are widgets. Essentially, they serve two different purposes. A layout tells you how to work and how to lay things out, you know, where to put things one relative to the other. For example, in a relative layout, which is the one we are using, uh, I am able to specify things like, uh, hey, put this centered on top, put this uh, uh, centered below, put this, you know, to the right of the other thing. You know, you can lay out things one relative to the other. It's probably, in my opinion, the, the most useful uh, layout you have. But you have others, okay? You can lay out things uh, um, vertically, one below the other, okay? And uh, the difference uh, from relative layout is that you don't need to bother, you, you know, you don't need to be bothered with exactly saying how much below, etc. It's more standard, right? You can uh, lay out things horizontally, you can make grids, uh, or you can do, uh, um, you know, you can, you can build a big frame that shows, uh, for example, a single picture or something like that, okay? And relative layout is a good start because you can play easily with putting other objects. Widgets, uh, there is a very, you know, large number of widgets, and there are all the elements that you can think of placing on uh, on the web page. Uh, oh, sorry, on the phone page. For example, let's uh, let's try. Now we take some large text. We can simply drag it. You see, this is a relative layout, so it's telling me, hey. Um, center horizontally and align it to the parent uh, top uh, with a margin of 55 dp. dp means uh, um, it's like a, um, how to say, it's a size uh, irrelevant uh, measure of distance. Okay, and so we say large text and we can change the text here and we can say, for example, uh, chicken. Okay, it's because in uh, in Italian I always use uh, chickens. Uh, no, I, it's not not true actually. What I really use is fruits. So uh, we can have my famous banana. Okay, uh, great. Um, so uh, so you see the, the banana is not a text view that is inside a relative layout. Okay. These uh, DPs are a bit of a headache, this measure of distance, because the problem is this, I don't know if you're the the problem is this, okay, that you want to still have some way to talk about distance. You cannot use pixels, because, you know, uh, there are fonts that have a lot different pixels per inch than other fonts, right? So if you still have pixels, your, your, your text could be too small or too close to other things. So you need something that is... Uh, somewhat uh, uh, irrespective of uh, 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 pixel size, but you also cannot in completely, uh, and you also try to um, ameliorate a little bit of the dependency on screen size, but up to some extent, you know? So, so this DP is a sort of mix, I don't know exactly what it is in the book, but it's some sort of fudge factor that makes it so that, you know, on average it's sort of kind of uh, displays correctly on many phones. If you wonder how it displays, uh, displays on other phones, so you go here and you see that instead of a Nexus 4, I have a Nexus 10 tablet. Oops, now this is how it looks. Okay, or uh, maybe I have a, what, what do I have, a Moto G that is not here. Uh, this is on the Nexus 5, you know, and, and so you can essentially test how your uh, code looks, I mean, how your layout looks on the different phones, yeah? Okay. Yeah, so you can play with it, and you know this is a big source of uh, of uh, headaches essentially, uh, because uh, um, unless you aim for a sort of a specific uh, slice of the market, now uh, it's possible to to do different layouts uh, according to whether we are on a tablet or on a phone. Okay, that's one of the uses of uh, of this uh, set content view statement in a conditional way. What you can write in the on create method is that you can write a test that says, hey, if my screen size, I will tell you how to write this test, but if my screen size is bigger than that, then use this layout, otherwise use that other layout. You know, you can do things like that. Um, okay, so now we have our banana. Um, we can also put buttons, uh, like a uh, uh, new button, okay? And you can say, click me. Okay, and so this becomes the name of the button. Um, you can add uh, uh, images, uh, toggle buttons, uh, check boxes, uh, you know. Uh, you can also um, enter um, 
text input fields. And you, you have many different inputs because you have different behaviors for the keyboard. For example, normal text behaves normally. Person names, uh, they will capitalize uh, every initial uh, letter, I believe. Um, postal address, I don't know what it does. Phone, you know, it will give you some, some easy way to enter a phone number. Email, uh, so, I mean, there, uh, uh, there are all the various possibilities, okay? So now I, I'll put a plain text field here. Okay, centered. No, actually, I don't center it. I put this, oops. Why is it so small? Okay, let me redo it a moment. It's easier to begin from scratch. Um, I want to put some plain text here. No, it really wants to be small. And I want to click, okay, now you can see why you can get a little bit maddening. Um, Mm. Okay. Um, ah, okay, I was able to. No. It's because it wants to align to something, okay? I, I need to give it a minimum size. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is one of the difference between uh, Android and uh, Studio and Eclipse. In Eclipse is actually put, ah, this is stupid. Hold on. Um, how do I give it? A, so there are all these parameters. How do I make it a certain width? Can you search if there is a solution? I mean, lay, layout width, wrap content. Okay, so instead I will uh, say something like field parent, okay? Fine. So th this worked. And now I want to put a button to the right of it. Um, so, you know, if you go crazy, you will not be alone, essentially. Okay, I put it here, aligned to the right of that, and uh, I say something like uh, enter. Okay, so I will be able to write something, enter it here, and I want it to appear there. That's what I'm trying to do in class uh, now or, uh, or next time, okay? Um, in fact, I, I think I can probably do it now. Shall we try? Yes, I think we can. Uh, just to give a, a la live example. Uh, Great. Now, what I need to do is this. Um, there is no relation between these various elements. So the code I need to write is this. I need to find when you click on the button. When you click on the button, I need to grab whatever is in that input field, and I need to put it into the item. OK? That's what I need to do. So at this point, I, um, I switch to the XML view here, okay, so this is the XML that is produced, okay? There is the text view, okay? The text view is that uh, where banana is written, okay? Then there is the edit text, which is that one. And then there is the button. And you can see that each one of these elements has an ID. And the ID is uh, what enables you to refer to the element from the code, okay? So now I do this, uh, from, uh, uh, I modify the button and I say Android, you see, uh, Android Studio helps you with, with all the possible things you can say. Uh, and I want to say, on click, uh, call this method uh, that says, uh, that is called the click enter. The method does not exist, right? But I need to write it. So I will write it. Um, now I go into the main activity here. This is the code. And uh, I want to say what happens when I, when I click enter. So I need to say public. Uh, void, click, enter, view, v. Okay, so a bit of explanation. Um, when, you, when you do a click, uh, and you say on click is equal to click, enter, Android looks for you for a method that has that signature. It returns void, so you cannot return anything, and then it has to have one parameter that is a view. What is a view? All these widgets, all these things that you ever lay out on the screen, anything you can possibly lay out on the screen is a child of, is a descendant of the view class. The view class is a, is a, I don't know how to put it, if you know HTML, it's a little bit of an HTML class. It's a thingy that stays there on the screen. No? <laughs> Whatever is the thing, that thingy might be. 
So since the clicking is a very general action, uh, it, it, you can click on anything, right? And so the signature of the method is, a, is, is this thing, okay? And the beauty of our code is particularly simple what we can do today, is that I don't care what thing it is, because the only way to generate this event, this enter, is if you click on the button, right? Because it's the only thing to which I define a non-click method. So I don't need to say now if V is this or if V is that or if V whatever. I basically disregard V. I just need it there right? because I need to have that particular signature. You know how in Java uh, you can have a different, uh, you can have functions that have the same name but are different types in the arguments, no? And so that matters. So if I give it instead of UV, if I say the, uh, you know, if I put it void, you know, if I left an empty argument list, I would get an error. Okay, I, I, it needs to have that signature. Okay, so once I'm here, I say gets the string in the input field. Okay, and so um, string te t for t for text is equal to, ah, okay. Um, how do you, we need to get hold of the input field. Okay, yep. Yes, 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 you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. I did a fantastic trick that I tell you all to do because otherwise you go crazy. It's, a, it's this. Go in code, okay? Go in, uh, no, sorry, not in code. Do the, set. go to settings, eh? go to editor, uh, and then go to auto import and check that you have these auto imports uh, checked. Okay, because the point is this, when I, when I say UV, uh, the editor, as you have to him, uh, will initially tell you, hey, I don't know what view is, uh, because you need to import the class U. No? And the point is that you will be importing classes so often that it's really quite boring uh, to have to import them manually every time you cite one of them. There are classes that you cite all the time and you don't want to bother with uh, manually tinkering. So, what I do is uh, I switch on this option, and in fact, here, if I expand this code of the, for the imports, uh, now you see that I'm importing Android view view, okay? And if I leave this expanded, you will see that as I type more code, more stuff will be imported on the Mac. Otherwise, you can import it manually. But if it is non-ambiguous, it's nice to have Android Studio import things for you without that, you know, because it's just uh, saving the work. Thank you very much. Yeah, I had to do it yesterday while I was saying, you know, why doesn't this work like Eclipse that I could just get it done? And so I searched. So, um, so okay, we, we wanted the string. So, but to get the string, I wanted the input field, right? So I, I need to do find the view by ID. So this is a general idea of in Android. Um, there is an ID, right? These, uh, these, uh, uh, these, uh, this is the edit text view, and uh, it has an ID. So you might think that I'm gonna use a string as the ID, but Android tries to optimize everything. So it's not of getting your XML file and recombines it in some way, okay? And then you generate a class called capital R for resources, which contains all, uh, which contains all the abbreviations in the files. Essentially, when it passes its XML file, it will say, ah, okay, fine. Uh, I'll generate uh, an integer that is called r.id.textView, which will be some integer, and we don't know what, okay? And in the class r, it will define the constant that refers to that integer. The advantage is that, so when you try to get hold of that view, it will uh, have an integer to look for and not a string. Now, you can see why this is a little advantage of the way Programmers sometimes optimize for crazy stuff that makes no sense. So, you know, I haven't told you that. But I suspect, you know, there is some mental short circuit somewhere. But, you know, I haven't said anything. But so in Android, essentially, you try to refer to things not by the names, but by the resource integers. Okay? So it is the same, actually, if you looked at the code here. You set content view to r.layout.activity main. This is an integer. Okay, that, is, uh, that refers to that XML file. So things have these integers as, as, as shorthand nicknames, whatever the reason might be. But so here, instead of just quoting the name, I have to say r.id. Dot, 
and then there is this edit view that will be defined somewhere edit text okay so you see how uh, how uh, in spite of the complexity but android studio is nice right because just because we drag and drop the, that edit text view somewhere now it knows that the in, in the class r there is an integer defined in order to refer to it so it's very nice it's a bit obnoxious of course because we would prefer a simpler method that that is nice for us but was also less complicated but but at least it's taken care for us in the background so is this clear it's a bit complicated, unfortunately, what really happens. So what really happens is this. In this XML file, we have declared this widget, which is an edit text widget. Android, whenever we define, I mean, not Android, but you know, the SDK, uh, Android Studio, whenever we define a widget, it takes the widget, compiles it without telling us anything, and puts an integer in desired class. And when we need to refer to that widget, we need to use that integer. It's unfortunately complex, but at least it's automatic, okay? So in fact, if you want to take the pain and do it, you can do this. You can do in the project, there is somewhere in build generated um, resources generated. Uh, no, sorry, I'm going to deep. Somewhere in this crazy stuff here, yeah. Where is it? Hey. I, I knew how to find it, find it in uh, uh, in in a, a Eclipse, uh, but but here I don't know where it ended up. Maybe they don't want me to see it. Building generated res generated. Do you know how to find that? Eh? Ah, okay. What? Control click. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, otherwise, I don't finish the example. I will tell you where to find this app, okay? I just wanted to show you that the thing exists. So, now, uh, no, no, hold on, I'm not quite done. This is the view, okay? Now, once I have the view, okay, the problem is this. Uh, so I wrote some incorrect code because I want to write, essentially, edit the text, uh, edit text uh, et is equal to, but I cannot write this, okay? This is a type error because find view by id gives me a generic view, okay? So I have to write uh, this code here, edit text, so I need to cast it to the right type. So much for type safety, no? Um, so now I have uh, the edit text where the text is. Fine. Now I can finally get the text. String t is equal to et dot get text. And you would think that get text gives you a string, but unfortunately it's not the case. It gives you some other stuff that is almost a quasi string. So you need to call a two-string method to get the string. Okay, now we get the string that was in the input. Now we have to put this string, uh, uh, you know, in the other field. So now we have to say, essentially, what is the other thing where, where we have to write it? It's, um, it's a text view, and it's called the text view, right? We will overwrite our banana. So uh, text view uh, TV is equal to text view. Uh, and you see that it's importing these things automatically when I mention them. Find the view by ID, r dot id dot uh, text view. Okay, so now we find our text view, and then we can do tv dot set text of uh, t. Ah, stop. Hey, okay, that's it. Okay, so this should do it. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I can save these, okay? Then I can run these, and uh, if you run, actually, you may want to do these, uh, some, some other small tricks for sanity. Uh, you go in edit configurations. No, where? Sorry. Um, mm. Well, okay, let me just run it, otherwise we... 
it will ask me how I want to run it, I guess. Okay, it's asking me what I want to use. I use these. Uh, And I should have it somewhere. OK, so sorry. I launched the new thing, and now I can see Apple. OK? I press Enter, and nothing happens. OK. <laughs> eh? OK, so I made some mistake, evidently. Great, we will have our first de debugging. Click Enter, and the code contains a click Enter. OK, this is surprising, actually. Strange. Because I had another app that just worked exactly in the same way, so I don't, I'm not quite sure what happened. Let me launch it again. Unless I'm getting the wrong text view. I mean, never. No, this is called the text view, so I don't have a lot of... Uh... Yeah, this is very strange. Okay, I'll have to debug. OK, um, I'll post why this doesn't work, actually. So it will be interesting. Thank you. What did you do in the settings before for the imports? 